Hey guys, Joe Pye here with Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. Got to start off by saying thank you to all my new subscribers and thank you to everyone that takes the time to leave me a comment. Do me a favor, if you're going to leave me a comment, uh, at the very end of your comment line, tell me where you're from. Tell me what country or state that you're from because I'm getting feedback from all over the world. I'm getting it from uh, Russia. I'm getting it from South Africa. I've got people in New Zealand, Australia. Uh, Dubai checked in the other day, which was really cool. Uh, Iceland, Ireland, a lot of people in the UK. So thank you people in the UK for watching. I know you probably watch while I'm sleeping. So it's nice to wake up in the morning and see that uh, all, you know, a lot of, lot of activity on the site, let's say that. Uh, I try to make my videos for you guys in such a manner that there's some theory that I introduce you to and then a practical demonstration. And if we were all to cover every aspect of a practical demonstration, it would be so long that you'd have to go and shave and take a shower and uh, you know feed the baby in the meantime because you just wouldn't want to watch the end of it. So I try to keep it short and sweet and if I skip over something, by all means point it out, but be kind. Anyway, got a call from a viewer, believe it or not, after I did that last video, the complex engraving on the CNC mill, the horse head that I did. And uh, Mr. Chuck Tipton, this one's for you, but I hope you don't mind me using your name. Uh, it's actually in my comment lines and most everybody can see it anyway. It's building a, a scale steam engine tractor. Beautiful piece of work. Chuck, it, you should put this thing online because it's really a nice piece of work. I can't imagine how much effort went into it. A lot like Mr. Crispin's locomotive that he's building. If you haven't seen Crispin's locomotive, go take a look at that. It's pretty incredible work. Anyway, the final detail for Chuck's steam tractor is the emblem that goes over the, the end of the, the nose. I don't know what it's called, so forgive me for that. But he sent me this drawing right here. I uh, downloaded it. And once I looked at it, I got in touch with Chuck and I said, you know, this is not an engraving job, although I could engrave that. You know, if you can draw it, I can engrave it. This is more what's called a volume milling job. And this is where you have a pocket that has detail in it. And when you send a cutter down inside that pocket to start dancing around, you have to leave material behind. So you don't want the cutter to collide with the characters or the dates or details or stars or whatever else you put on here. So doing this is a little bit more involved. Anyway, I pulled it off and I made one out of aluminum just for myself, just to see uh, the scale, the size, look for bad code, anything else. And it looks like this. I certainly hope you can see that because this is a nice, nice piece of work. This is actually the first time that I've done this. So Chuck, thank you. You inspired me to get outside of my comfort zone and experiment with something that I've never done. I've never generated CNC code like this. I can do trajectories and, and engraving and, and stuff like that. But I've never done a volume milling where you take material away from something that has internal positive features like these letters I don't know if you can see that or not but they're they're actually raised up inside this little undercut this is substantially thicker than the final part will be and Chuck wants this in brass so I'm going to show you what it's going to take to go from here to here in brass and I'm going to try to keep it manageable as far as time is concerned so let's take a look and see what it takes to get from here to there Okay hey guys, the first thing you got to do is uh, start a working directory somewhere. I'm going to go back here to Chuck's directory. Say OK. Now I'm going to start a new part. Name the part. Let's call it CT for lack of a less creative name. All right. Now. We're going to rotate this particular part around the center line. And there's the center line. I'm going to turn off all these unwanted parts. And now I'm going to sketch the geometry after I say that that's the axis of revolution, of course. Let's touch the geometry. Since this is a washer, I'm going to make the trough. And let's throw some dimensions on there.
Now, design intent is a very big part of any design project. Put your dimensions on your part, drive your dimensions on your part based on what you think the part might look like in the future. If I were to dimension the inside of this part as two diameters, and I were to change the outside diameter, this would probably just stay put and the outside diameter would wipe it right off. So these little lips are more important to me than anything else. So I'm gonna call them 30 thou piece. Now, no matter how big the ID or the OD gets, these lips are gonna stay 030. The final part was requested at 0.093, so we're gonna shrink the height a little bit. And this pocket here, 40 thou. Oops, excuse me. We're gonna to have to just say okay on that, delete that dimension, and make the pocket depth 040. All right, now that's much better because no matter how thick the part gets, this 040 pocket will always be 040. All right, so the thickness is good, the pocket depth is good, the ribs are good. Now everything is gonna move accordingly. We're gonna go 1.55 on the inside of this, uh-oh, it just blew up. What happened? Let's do the outside first. 1.675. Okay, now we can do the inside. 1.55. Well, I'm not quite sure what's going on, Pilgrim, but that's not looking good. That is definitely not the way this is supposed to look. Let's try 2.675. There you go. All right. That's much better. Hit the OK. Hit the OK again. All right. Now we have the raw blank, the emblem. Now we just want to put some text inside of that, and then we'll drive some code off of that. So now I know in my software I can elevate text but there's an option that says place the text around a curve. So I need to create a curve in here somehow, somewhere, that's going to drive this text. And that's going to be a little icon up here in the corner. That's the plane I want to draw on. And here we go. Just going to be a plain old line. Locked onto the center, and out we go. Now, I don't want a height, I don't want a length, but I do want an angular reference so that I can change the location of this text in the future. So I'm going to pop an angle in there, and let's call it 20 degrees. And just for reference so this line doesn't go away, I'm going to give it a length as well. That means nothing, but there it is. Okay. So now we have a curve. Actually, we have an angular reference. We do not have the round curve yet. I'm going to put it right down here inside this pocket. I'm going to use my radius feature. I'm going to pick the sketch. I'm going to go back to sketch references, and I want to drive off my original curve right here. So if I change this, my round curve goes with it. OK, let's go back to the radius feature. Make this bones so I can see it. And just for whatever, I'm going to take that curve all the way around here. And you can see this particular line right here. That's where I want my text to sit. I like it. Now I want those letters to be extruded, just like anything else. And I want to define my internal sketch on that plane. And off we go. Go over to my font selector. Let's go back to the sketch references, of course. We want that curve, and we want that curve. All right. Font selector. I want to just lock it right onto both curves at the starting point. And I'm going to say cap lock, C period, space, P period, space, T I P T O N. CP tip. Down here on the bottom it says place along the curve. And I have to go back here and select my curve. And it certainly looks like it may have done it. Okay. 
See, it just took and placed it right around that curve. Even though the curve is non-existent at the end of the characters, it continued to follow the same radius. Now, if I were to get very deep into this and follow this all the way through to the final engraving job, you'd be old and gray by the time I was done with it. So I'm going to say I like it the way it is. All right, now it's extruded. Very tall, up off the part. My software asks me how where I want to extrude it to. So I can either put a number in here, or I can tie it to one of the other surfaces that I know it's going to be tied to forever. And that's the selection I'm going to pick. I want it right here on this top surface. Right there. Okay, now those letters are as tall as that cross-section undercut is deep. And we say okay. There you go. Now it's a little bit out of, out of uh, sync, the rotation, the aspect angles. And on the one that I just finished for Chuck, I didn't like the way the P's come out. You can see how this P is not in sync with the rest of the characters here. It's crowding the I, and it just rotationally, it doesn't look like it points at the center. The I points at the center, the T points at the center, and for some reason this P is pointing out in left field. So on the real ones that I did for Chuck, I actually got in here and I cut this P out and I moved it over and I positioned it so that it was aesthetically appealing. And that was no easy chore. Now when you're doing something like this for a volume milling operation, you have to know what size your cutter is. And then when your model is complete like this, you have to zoom in on these little features and make sure that that cutter is going to fit between those two walls. And if you're going to use a toothpick size cutter, it's going to take you forever to whittle this thing out. So you want to use a cutter that's not going to snap off 11,000 lines into your program and you have to start over. And there's two hours out the window. So there's a lot to be considered when doing something like this. And it was quite a juggling act to get to Chuck's final. But I'll show you what the final model looks like. Let's see, CT assembly. Symbol rotated. There we go. This is the final model that I will drive from, and this is ultimately what Chuck wants to see his emblem look like. It's going to be made out of brass. Right around the letters is going to be backfilled with a red enamel to match the rest of the model that he's building, and it is a spectacular model. I hope he posts something about it online after he gets this emblem and puts it on. So you've got his initials, and the, I guess it's the two years that it took for him to build this. Anyway, this is, you can see how the P has been corrected. The gap between all the characters to the inner races and ribs has been adjusted. Uh, all the characters have been adjusted accordingly so that the cutter can get in here. So there is a tremendous amount of handwork. The six had to be rebuilt. The five had to be rebuilt. Uh, the five has actually been sectioned in half and stretched a little taller. The model has been rotated so that all of the text is clocked accordingly and it's very visually appealing and that's what we're going to download some code for and get out on the machine and get after. Okay I know the OD of this particular finished emblem is 2.675 so we're going to go with quarter inch by three inch brass. There it is. It's going to look a whole lot different here shortly so stay tuned we're going to chop a piece off in this saw right back okay well this is unacceptable don't ever use a saw that has a dirty table uh, I could do this manually but through the magic of video I am just gonna snap my fingers and this is all gonna go away okay guys let's talk about blade selection here for a second you can see that the blade on this machine is rather aggressive right now and the good rule of thumb for selecting a bandsaw blade for the material that you're gonna cut so they always say to have two teeth in contact buried in the part at all times. So you wouldn't want to use a blade on this material that had teeth that were this far apart because if the material gets in between the teeth, it can be too much of a load on the teeth. It'll bend the part, it'll strip the teeth off, and it'll basically ruin your day. If you have to get through a job with a blade that has large teeth 
and your material is thin, put a piece of hard board or plastic or something underneath your part so that there's at least some resistance on the blade and it doesn't go sour really quick. Keep the height of your guide just over the top of your part. That takes the unnecessary flex out of the blade. Now as far as speed is concerned with aluminum, wood, plastic, brass, any of the composites, you can run them fairly high or, or in high range. If your saw isn't adjustable, keep it in the high range. When you're cutting steels, use a finer blade, slow the machine down. Let's cut a piece off and take it over to the mill. square. Okay guys, when you're machining the first side of anything that's relatively flat, set your parallels up in your vise and find out if it's sitting flat at all. You can hear the tap on the opposing corners here, which means this part is bowed this way. Now if you were to tap this down and fly cut it, when you released it after the first side op, it would pop again. So if you're looking for a flat part, do not tap down the first side. Just locate it against your parallels. Give it a squeeze. Gentle snug is good enough. If you hit it too hard, it could crown or it could go inside. And when you're done, it's not flat again. I always slip my machine out of gear. And I move my fly cutter to its extremes to see if it's going to cover the whole part. When I'm content with how the tool is going to hit, I'll put it back in gear. Make sure your column is against the stop and everything is securely locked. You can come down with the cutter or you can come up with the table. Let's turn this machine on and make a cut. This particular tool is a single edge fly cutter and it is an exceptionally dangerous tool because at a high RPM you can only see the body of the tool and not the projection.
you can see if the light isn't sufficient, then the reflection goes away and it really gets dangerous. Okay, let's deburr this piece, flip it over, and do the other side. Okay, with the first side complete, like I said, don't get carried away on the amount of torque you put on it. But it's okay to tap it down now. Definitely don't do this with the machine turned on. You can confirm that the part is securely against the parallels by trying to push the parallels left and right once the part's secured. If the parallels don't move, you know you got good contact. Let's clean it up. Okay, well if there's any issues with your head being out of square, when you're using a large diameter cutter or a fly cutter, you're definitely going to see uh, that particular situation. When you have the back side of the cutter leaving just a witness mark on the top of your part like that, you can't even feel it, you would have to think that your head is fairly square. If the head of the machine is out of square, you're going to take a nice cut with the front of the tool, and when the back of the tool comes along, you're going to see another cut as well. So that's a pretty good indication that your head is out of square and you might have to take a look at it. Okay guys, the material has been flattened out. There's a Sharpie mark or reference mark in the center of the part and I know the final part is a lot smaller than the blank. So close enough is good enough. Code is loaded in the machine. There's about 14,000 lines of code on this one. These are the tools we're going to be using. It's going to be a 532nd two flute carbide and an 062 diameter stubby ball nose carbide right there. So this guy's going to do all the whittling around the letters and this guy's going to do the large open spaces around the characters. Let's load them up and get it ready to go. Okay guys, the coolant hoses have been aimed. The tools are set up. Everything has been calibrated and registered against the top of the plate that's in the machine. The code in the controller has been edited and about the only thing left to do now is cross my fingers and hope that everything is uh, going to work out. So here we go Chuck. We are going to press the go button and see what happens. The 156 diameter tool is in there now, tearing up all the uh, big open spaces that if you had to weasel that out with the little 062 end mill, you'd be here for a month of Sundays. There's still 13,000 lines of code here and we are right at the very beginning. I expect this to run for about two hours. So we are going to kick out and come back when we're a little bit closer to the end, blow it off and uh, show you what we got. All right, see you in a bit. Here we go, second tool. Ah, I'm really hoping for good luck here. We'll find out. Okay guys, the code ran its course, 14,000 lines of code, 1 hour, 27 minutes, and 7 seconds, 2 tools. We're going to get a look at this for the first time together. 
And you know, after you do something like this, the first thing you want to do is make sure that the tool is still there. So if the tool is intact, which it is, chances are the emblem looks pretty good. Let's check it out. How can you not be happy with that? Now the difference in the surface finishes here are the, the differences in the two types of tools, uh, profile as well as size. The shiny one here is the Two Flute 156, and the one that looks more matte is a ball nose tool, it's a round nose tool, so the step over or the incremental moves to the next line of cut is really small, so it looks more like a scratch than an actual cut. But these characters are 40 thousandths of an inch deep. And I do not want my camera to get dripped on, so I'm just going to position. But boy, I am happy with that. That is really pretty. Going to pop a hole here in the center, give me something to uh, hang on to at a later date. Then we're going to take it back over to the bridge port, thin it down, put it on an arbor, and cut the OD. I'm really pleased with that. All righty, stay tuned. Hey guys, I just added another tool for the center bore. We're going to interpolate this, which means we're going to take this uh, 375 diameter end mill right here, and we're going to plunge it down through the center of this, and then we're going to walk it in counterclockwise circles until it cuts out a 1 inch 550 diameter right in the middle. And I've lied to my tool tables, I've told them that this tool is a little bit bigger, so the bore is going to end up smaller, which will allow me to tweak the diameter in the offsets and make that diameter the correct size for the customer. I'm going to turn the feed rate all the way down, hit the go button. Right now the machine is on hold and I have what's a, uh, called a scratch pass. It's just going to go very slightly into the surface of the part so I can confirm that all the settings are good and uh, we're going to have what we hope we're going to have. Alright, I'm looking for a 30 thousandths lip that does not get cut off to form a uh, barrier for the letters. This tool should get to the middle of the part and retract the center and come back up. There we go. I like it. I've got my 30 thou border all the way around. I'm going to change the value of this tool in the offset so that it goes completely through the part, turn the coolant on, and make this bore. Okay guys, I skipped a couple of steps to save some time, but after it comes out of the mill, we feed it into the sandblaster, and we blast the cutting lines away from in between the characters and in between the fields. And then we run it on a flat surface, which is probably always going to be the table of my saw here, because I don't like doing it on the granite. But you grain it out on the top of a piece of emery to get the sandblast finish removed from the high spots on the engraving. And now we're going to put it in the mill and relieve it down to the thickness that the customer has requested. I think uh, 330 seconds, 093, 095 is what I'm going to shoot for. So let's pop it in the mill and cut the back. Okay guys, the part's now loaded in the machine with the engraving side down. And I think you can see now why I left this a square so I could hold on to it and thin it out at the very last operation, or second to last operation. Now if this was round, it would have been more difficult to hold in the CNC. I could have put aluminum jaws in, made a pocket jaw, and, and squeezed it that way. But I choose, I like to do it this way. I'm going to cut this down. I need to remove 133 thousandths off of this uh, face right here. And if I were to remove it from the outside in, it would be real thin on the outside and have more of a tendency to bow or crown initially. So when I remove the material, 
I'm going to remove it from the inside out so that I can keep as much meat out here as possible and reduce the distortion uh, as much as possible until the very last time. So we're probably going to speed this film up. It may take a couple of seconds to actually hand cut this, but I need to take 133 thou off of this, and then we're going to go to the lathe and make it round and make it beautiful. So hang in there. Hey guys, off camera, I took the liberty of putting a piece of uh, high density plastic. This is Celcon, also known as Delrin, acetyl, copolymer, whatever, in the chuck. And I turned it, a uh, small boss, to the same thickness or the same diameter as the inside of the emblem. For maximum surface contact, I'm going to slip this over top of the boss. I also sawed the corners off so it wouldn't be too bad, but there's going to be some kind of impact, so we're going to be careful. This is going to be a pressure turning operation. I am not going to grip this because I wouldn't want to distort it or destroy it. So I'm going to put a piece of cardboard over the front of it. And I'm going to drive it strictly under pressure this way. there you go uh, let's see we use the vertical bandsaw a couple of times we use the CNC mill we use Pro Engineer Wildfire 4.0 we used a Cal Motion USB flash drive code transfer system we used a Bridgeport style knee mill we used an engine lathe a sandblaster and a little bit of handwork piece of cake two and three quarter inch diameter actually 2.675 about 090 thick brass CNC mill job Chuck this is on its way to you and I hope you like it buddy